Hi everyone, so we're going to start getting our teeth into the quantum world material after the last video which was all about the overall structure and sort of teaching philosophy and some of the philosophical ramifications. Now we're going to start focusing on the core concepts. And the first thing we're going to do is really to hammer home and try to answer and address this key point as to what exactly is a state in physics. What do we mean by a state in classical physics and how different is a quantum state from a classical state. Let's think about simple particles, purely classical particles. Think about how we define the state of a particle. And the way we define the state of a particle, or an object, or a system, is in terms of its position and its momentum. So, position vector and a momentum vector. Of course, momentum is a vector. We can make this more straightforward, we can do what we did in from Newton to Einstein, or do what you did in from Newton to Einstein last year. Let's just think of it in terms of just one dimension. So instead of that position vector r, we'll think just of in terms of one dimension x. And we'll think about it just moving along in one direction. And let's reduce it even simpler, make it really, really straightforward. Let's think about it's a particle moving at constant velocity without any external force, so ex ignore my hand, and it's just moving along a constant velocity, with a velocity v. Now, in terms of the position and the momentum, and the momentum is constant because the velocity is constant, the mass is constant, position is changing, of course. How do we update the, the state of the system? How do we know the, st the, the states of the system? How do we calculate the state of the system? So, we can write down a very simple differential equation, which you've seen before many times. The most simple differential equation probably that we can think of. A velocity is constant, and that tells us the rate of change of our position. So, in terms of the state of the system, let's say it starts off here, it's moving at constant velocity, and we want to know how does the state of our position change well, its velocity staying the same, so its momentum staying the same, but how does its position change from, say, this instant to this instant? And let's say, for want of a better example, we're thinking about it in, in spaces of one second. So we want to know, is this the state of our system at t equal to zero? Let's say it starts at um, uh, position zero and it moves along. And it's moving along at a constant velocity of one meter per second. That means in one second it will have moved one meter. Okay, so I'm not telling you anything new here, but important thing is we're defining the state of the system in terms of the position and the momentum. I also mentioned last lecture that I'm, I'm very keen to get you thinking about how to code things. And so let's think about how we'd code this. And in fact, thinking about how we'd code this helps us to really embed that idea of a state of the system that we're updating. So we would rewrite that as V is equal to delta X over delta T. Or, that implies that, let's write it like that, delta x is equal to v delta t. In other words, just the same thing again, if we're moving at one meter per second, our delta x after one second, if our delta t is one second, then our delta x is going to be one meter. Simple as that. In terms of writing some code, let me just move up a little bit further on the board. Of that. How would we define this? Well, we can use arrays, vectors, to define our x. And let's say we start off with our initial position at the origin, x0, x0. What's our rule for updating that position? Well, we can just take this, and we know that our new x, let's call it xn plus 1, is equal to our old x, xn, plus delta x. And let's also assume, in terms of where we're defining things, let's set v is equal to 1, 1 meter per second, we'll use SI units in this particular case. SI units are not always, particularly when we talk, to quant talk about quantum problems, SI units are not always the most convenient units. We're in the big bad classical world now, so let's stick with SI units. 1 meter per second, we define our, our position, our starting position as being at the origin. So our new position is our old position plus delta x. We are updating the state of the system in units of time 
on the basis of a differential equation. So we do that as well in quantum mechanics. Excuse me, I'll just have a sip of coffee. We do that, we do that as well in quantum mechanics, except you'll know from last year, you'll know from Newton to Einstein that we've got a bit of a problem in terms of defining something with specific values of position and specific values of momentum due to the uncertainty principle. So we've got to rethink how we define a state in quantum mechanics. Here's how we're going to define a state. Now, something right at the start, you notice TQW postulate one, so the quantum world postulate one. This is a postulate. So something has been postulated. It hasn't been derived. It's been something where it's been put forward as an hypothesis and this agrees with the data, this agrees with experimental observations and experimental observables. This is how it works. But in terms of deriving that from some deeper wisdom, that's not what's happened. It's a postulate. And we're going to see a number of different postulates. And the reason I call it TQW postulate one rather than postulate one by itself is that if you go from quantum textbook to quantum textbook, you'll find that there are um, just how the postulates are put forward differs from textbook to textbook in terms of how they're phrased, but also in terms of how they're numbered, and indeed in terms of how many of them there are. Moreover, I don't want to just present all the postulates in one go. I want to present them as we go along, talk you through them, and try and make as much connection with what's gone before as possible. So this is a bit of a mouthful, it's gotta be said, but you know all this. You've covered all this. You might have forgotten it, but certainly, and from Newton to Einstein, you've covered this. And also, to an extent, for those of you who've done Frontiers, you've also done this. The state of a non-relativistic quantum mechanical particle at time t is specified by a continuous, single-valued, complex function, psi. This function, called the wave function, or state function, has the property that the complex conjugate of psi multiplied by psi d tau is the probability that the particle lies in the volume element d tau located at position vector r at time t. Lots of words. You have come across those concepts before. But one thing I want to really focus on right now before we go any further is this. The complex aspect of this. Why complex? Why are the complex numbers embedded deep in the heart of quantum mechanics? Before we do that, before we address that question, let's first of all go back, have a little bit of a revisor on just what we mean by complex numbers and some of the key properties of complex numbers that we're going to need for the quantum world. We define a complex number this way. It's got a real and an imaginary part. We define its complex conjugate this way. Now, we can also define what this looks like on the complex plane. This is a real axis, this is our imaginary axis. And let's say we've got a complex number z equal to x plus i y. Now, that's a rectangular definition as it's described, but we are going to be really most interested in the polar representation of this, whereby we've got an angle phi, and this distance represents the modulus of our complex number z. Okay, so we've got a modulus, and we've got this angle, which is called the phase angle. Quite why it's called the phase angle, we'll get to in a second. But let's just describe this now. We've got these are in terms of the rectangular coordinates or Cartesian, if you want to put it that way. Let's do it in terms of polar. So we've got z is equal to the modulus, which is that length, and the magnitude, whatever you want to call it, times e to the i phi, okay, where phi is this angle. This is our modulus, and this. Sorry, and this is called our phase factor. And similarly, for our complex conjugate, that's that, because this is real, remember, this modulus bit is real, 
and then this becomes e to the i phi. You're also going to have to remember this beautiful Euler construction, or Euler formula, which ties together, let's keep things constant, e to the i phi, constant in terms of notation, e to the i phi is equal to cos phi plus i sine phi, which couples together complex exponentials and trigonometric functions. So, why is this called a phase angle? Well, there's this beautiful animation which shows you just why this is called a phase factor, because it is defining the phase of the associated waveform. That video really speaks a thousand words. I could bang on drawing on the blackboard for hours and still not get it across as, as well as in that video. You'll see that it's defining the phase of the wave. So, what's what happens now? We'll stick with this, these definitions. You know this as well, but this is so important when it comes to, to quantum mechanics. If we take complex number z, multiply by a complex conjugate, that gives us z e to the i phi by the, sorry, I should have said modulus of z by e to the i phi, modulus of z by e to the minus i phi. This by this, gives us 1, so we are left with the modulus of z squared. What is absolutely key to recognize here is that we've, we've got a purely, well, two things, purely real number, and secondly, we have eliminated, by taking the modulus squared, by taking the complex conjugate and multiplying it by the, the, the original complex number, we have got rid of the phase component. We've got rid of the phase factor. We've got rid of the phase information. And so, when we go back to that postulate, this function called the wave function or state function has the property that the complex conjugate of the wave function multiplied by the wave function d tau is the probability that the particle lies in the volume element d tau located at r at time t. Note that we are taking the complex conjugate and multiplying it by the original complex number, complex function, to give us something which is real real valued, mathematically real, rather than complex. By doing that, we get rid of the phase factor. We get rid of the phase information. But that phase information, as we're going to see, is absolutely crucial in terms of how quantum systems behave and how quantum systems interact. It's worth noting in this rather wonderful book, Feynman is going to crop up, not occasionally throughout this module, Feynman had some character flaws, but there's a reason he's quoted time and time and time again in so many areas of physics, is that he was not only an exceptionally good, brilliant phys physicist, he was also gifted in terms of communicating the science. And if you want to find a pithy um, explanation of a key, pe of key piece of physics, Usually Feynman is the person that's, um, you know, the, the first go-to person. And in this, what's amazing, what's really, really neat, is he talks about um, quantum mechanics. He doesn't mention that phase factor, but he describes everything. This is um, uh, not meant for physicists. This is meant for a general audience. He defines everything in terms of little arrows. So just as we have with that Wikipedia video, that little arrow going around the vector, moving around as, as the phase changes. And we don't really have to mention phase in that sense to get the key ideas, but phase and complex numbers really are crucially important in terms of an elegant, compact mathematical framework for describing what's going on in quantum mechanics. I don't think I can put it any better than this wonderful XKCD cartoon. Okay, anyone who's feeling like they can't handle the physics here should probably just leave now. I'm multiplying the wave function by its complex conjugate. That's right, shit just got real. Before we get into the details of just what's happening there, the important thing to recognize is that STM is mapping out the probability density. It's mapping out the modulus squared of the wave function. So we can see that in experiment. We can see that observable. 
Okay, let's call a halt there. I'm really keen, if you'll excuse the pun, to sort of keep the quantum of time associated with these videos to the sort of 15, 20 minute limit. I think that's a good sort of slot of time for you to focus on one topic before we move on to the next. Okay, next video, all about the double slit experiment and interpreting the double slit experiment using the same type of complex analysis we've just um, looked at in this video. See you then.